This video will instruct you on how to install a two-stroke bicycle engine kit on a bike. Now before we even start, it's important to know what you're getting into and what you need to make sure installation goes as smooth as possible. First things first, the bike. Even though the engine kit is made to be as universal as possible, a few key features your bike should have will make installation a lot easier. Your bike needs to be a standard male beach cruiser, road, or hardtail mountain bike. The tubes should be 25 to 28 millimeter in diameter with an open V style frame. The frame should also have a 9 to 11 inch of clearance between the bottom bracket and top bar. The kits will fit most 26 inch by 1.75 inch wheel with a standard 12 or 14 gauge 36 count spoke. If you're in these right specifications, then you're good to go. Every engine kit should come with the following. A two stroke engine block, a carburetor, muffler exhaust, a chain guard, clutch cable and throttle cable, throttle assembly, which is the grips and kill switch, clutch lever, a drive chain idler pulley, the 415 engine drive chain, a two stroke spark plug, the electron ignition coil, a 1.5 or 2.5 liter gas tank, a fuel line, a gasoline tank switch or fuel valve, a sprocket clamp assembly, a 44 tooth chrome drive sprocket with nine holes, the heat shield spring, which is the large spring, and a recoil spring, which is the extension clutch spring, and other miscellaneous hardware. This is a rear sprocket clamp assembly with it all attached together. It comes with nine bolts and nuts, a pair of metal plates, and a set of three metal plates on the other side with two grommet pieces in between. Now at this point, go ahead and unscrew the nuts and organize your pieces. All the nuts and bolts are 10 millimeter head sizes and the tools you'll need are a pair of 10 millimeter socket wrenches or an optional open wrench and scissors. If you're working with a coaster brake arm, you have to remove it. Make sure not to accidentally disassemble the entire axle doing so however, so take special care. Next. Grab one of the ground pieces and cut a straight line between any of the two holes. Thread it through the hub like so. Check to make sure all the holes has a clear opening through the spokes. Now just do a quick check by dry fitting the sprocket, making sure it fits. Now step four is the longest and most time consuming portion. Set up all the metal plates and align all of it with the sprocket. Now, start pushing the bolts through the assembly. You want the three-way plates to be on the back end. Now, you notice that these bolts already have the nuts on, but it's really only there to keep them in place until I start installing the plates. You have to remove them after. Now, the reason why you need to use these plates is because they act like balance boards. For example, if you place a bowling ball in the middle of a mattress, it'll sink where it lands. However, if you place a board on top of that mattress and then place the bowling ball, the weight of the ball will be dispersed more evenly. This is basically what the metal plates are doing. We are distributing the torque of these bolts more evenly, and it's important for proper sprocket alignment. It also requires a lot less tuning, which is why it's important to install these plates on the sprocket clamp assembly, which is pretty smart. So we made it to step five. Once all the pieces are put together and the nuts are all hand tightened, go and tighten down the bolts with the wrenches. You want to tighten it down as tight as possible without bending the spokes. The key is tightening everything down evenly, sort of like doing it in phases. So you want to tighten them down at the same level every time. As you tighten the bolts down, keep watch of the center sprocket. Make sure it still stays centered throughout this process or else you'll risk having to loosen the bolts and adjusting the sprocket again. Once it gets tighter and tighter, you'll notice that any overlap you encountered with the metal plates from the beginning should go away. Now, step six is optional. Uh, if you want to reinstall the coaster brake arm, you're more than happy to do so. For the most part, the coaster brake arm should clear the bolts from the sprocket. However, depending on certain rear wheels, it just won't happen. For this, the 12 gauge 26 inch rear wheel, it unfortunately does not do so. We are unable to clear the bolts. So with that, you have two options. You can bend the coaster brake in two places, explained in the four stroke video, or you can ditch the coaster brake arm and install caliper brakes on your bike. Whatever you do, 
make sure you have brakes. They are very important to have with motorized bikes and we strongly recommend being safe when riding these. Once you're done, reinstall the bike chain and bolt the rear wheel back on the frame. That's it. Engine mounting can go one of two ways, easy or a little challenging, and all that depends on your frame style. An old style beach cruiser frame will more than likely be an easier fit for your engine because of the consistent tube diameter and center crank position. If your bike is in this style, mounting the engine is self-explanatory and it's a simple setup. Newer styles generally have a larger down tube diameter, a larger top tube diameter, or forward pedaling crank positions. For this demonstration, we picked a bike with all three styles. To combat larger down tubes, the engine kit comes with a universal U-mount. To combat forward pedaling cranks, you have to purchase and install the JNM vibration motor mounts. If you have both styles, a large diameter down tube and forward pedaling cranks, you need both the vibration motor mounts and the heavy duty universal U-mount. If you only need to install the universal mount, you first must prep the engine. Step one, remove the front engine mount studs. You can either use vice grips or the two nut method to remove it. The two nut method requires two threaded nuts with the top one and the bottom one threaded together and tighten up as tight as possible between them. Then take an open wrench and torque the bottom nut to start removing the stud. Once removed, place the universal mount over the threads and install the bolts that came with the universal mount assembly. And that's it. Universal mounts are pretty easy to install overall. If you, however, purchased our DIY engine biking kit combo, most of them include the JNM vibration motor mounts due to the four pedals on the beach cruisers we carry. To install these, remove the front and rear mounting studs using the same method as mentioned earlier. Two, replace them with the extended mounting studs from the kit. Three, thread the rubber mounts and you're done. Go install it on your bike. For this bike, we are encountering both issues. So to solve it, Install the JNM vibration motor mount, position it on the bike the way you want it mounted, and then take the HDU mount, remove one of the two U brackets, and install it on the bike like so. The parts of the clutch are the clutch cable, clutch lever, heat shield spring, and clutch spring. One, install the clutch cable into the clutch lever. The clutch cable has two different looking ends. You wanna take the one with the nipple piece and push it into the lever socket. Then thread the rest of the wire through the lever assembly and tighten it down. Two, 
Thread the heat shield spring through the opposite side of the lever. Then thread the wire itself through the clutch base screw. Three, thread the clutch spring, then thread the wire through the clutch arm on the engine. Make sure you loosen the screw on the top of the clutch arm before threading. The key for proper installation is making sure the clutch arm is flush with the engine. Once you pull the clutch lever, the clutch arm should move in towards the engine. With the clutch arm pulled in, you are disengaging the engine, allowing for you to pedal and use your bike normally. With the clutch lever released, it locks the clutch and engages the motor. There are many ways and methods to install the chain. The best way we found is to remove some key components from the engine block to free the 10 tooth drive sprocket up. 1. On the opposite side of the clutch, remove the gear case cover. Then unscrew the screw pin and unscrew the flower nut. One of the best ways to remove this is to simply press the clutch cover down, freeing up the flower nut. Once the flower nut is taken off, remove the clutch cover. You'll notice that if you spin these three pegs that the drive sprocket will spin as well. 3. Now remove the clutch case cover. Let it hang in place once you removed all the screws. Doing this exposes the 10 tooth sprocket and exposing the opposite side makes it spin freely for an easier installation. 4. Grab your chain and remove the master link. I used needle nose pliers to pop off the clip and then disassemble. Five, measure the chain on the rear and front sprocket. Remove any unnecessary links. Make sure you provide little slack when measuring. We recommend about a half inch of play. Then reinstall the master link. Six, reinstall the clutch case cover. And seven, reinstall the gear case assembly and cover. When installing the pulley, the first thing you should do is adjust the wheel position the way you want, then tighten it down on the frame. Place the idler on the frame and tighten it till it's snug, but not too tight that you can't adjust it. When you do adjust it, you adjust it in two ways. You want to make sure that the chain is tight, providing less than a half inch play in the chain movement. And the second way is making sure that the chain is aligned straight for proper chain guidance. Once you have it just right, tighten the bolts down. From this point, the pulley will move side to side and off position. So we recommend just watching that and making sure that when you are tightening it, that you keep adjusting it and keeping it to the position that you want it. Before installing the throttle handles, you must first remove your pre-existing grip handles. Once you've done so, dry fit the throttle grip and kill switch on the right side of the handlebar. Then, Mark where you need to drill a quarter inch hole into the handlebar. Once you've done so, grab the throttle cable and thread the L bracket side of it into the kill switch housing. Once you have it tightened down, reinstall it on the handlebar and screw in the top piece. The other end of the cable is installed inside the carburetor. Unscrew the bottom end of the carburetor and remove the following pieces. The screw top, the spring, 
the plunger piece and the jet needle with the C-clip attached and the e-washer. You want to take the end of the throttle cable and thread it through the screw top. Then through the spring. With the plunger piece, make sure the jet needle and e-washer is in the assembly. Then thread the throttle cable through the plunger piece like this. Guide it back into the carburetor and screw it back down. Once you've installed the throttle cable into the carburetor, go ahead and loosen the carburetor screw and then install it over the manifold. With the electrical components, I'll let our technician Johnny explain it. There are three electrical parts to the engine. There's the spark plug, the magneto loop set, and the CDI. The CDI can be mounted anywhere on the bike as long as it can reach the spark plug. The spark plug is placed on the head and the magneto loop set sits inside the engine. When it comes to wiring, you may need a splice of wire, which involves cutting and stripping the insulation away from the tip of the wire. But otherwise, it's pretty simple. You just plug in the male to the female end and voila. So you connect the black wire from the CDI to the black wire from the magneto and the green wire from the kill switch. These wires are your ground wires that complete the circuit. Next, the blue wire from the CDI connects the blue wire from the magneto and the red and yellow wire from the kill switch. Now you can check to see if you're wired properly by moving the spark plug and checking for spark. You have to make sure it rests on the head cap to ensure visible spark. Rotate the rear wheel while engaged to create spark. Once you have all the major components attached, install the remaining parts. Screw on the exhaust. Install the gas tank. If you have a larger diameter top tube like this bike has, you will need the wide gas tank mount. To install the wide gas tank mount, it requires a little bit more elbow grease, but it is definitely worth it. Take the white gas tank mount and bend them straight. Then bend them by where the holes are. Do it for both brackets. Then, install the gas tank. Once the gas tank is installed, install the fuel valve and fuel line. To install the chain guard, thread the front into the long stud of the clutch case cover, then tighten it down with a nut. Use a zip tie to attach the guard to the frame, making sure you provide room in the chain and the tire so the chain guard doesn't rub up against it. Great, your motorized bike installation is complete. 
Here are a few last words in regards to maintenance and fuel. Your engine will start and ride rough in the beginning and it's normal. Brand new engines need time to break in and let all the seals and gaskets set. The following is the fuel ratio for the break in period. The break in period lasts for the first four tanks of gas. Oil dripping out of the exhaust is normal during this time period. It is excess oil that hasn't been burned from the engine. After the break in period, the fuel ratio is as follows. Other videos, tips, tricks, and how-to tutorials come and visit bikeberry.com and check out our YouTube channel as well.